Adults, hello. How y'all doing out there? That is our by youth. Uh, if you would go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the prophet Hag- Haggai. The prophet Haggai. And we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. Haggai, verses 10 through 19. And when you get there, just give me a smile or a nod. I think most of y'all are there. And this is what the prophet wrote. Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priests concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, Will it become holy? Then the priests answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these things, will it become unclean? So the priests answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So so is this the people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your blessings. And God, we desire to experience you daily. Because Lord, your desire is for us to know you daily. And to experience you daily. Lord, help us to slow down. Help us to take these distractions and these worries and push them aside. Let the very Spirit of Jesus minister and change our hearts that we may pray for others, Lord, that we may serve others, and Lord, that we may give you all the glory when we do these things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what I've discovered in life that everybody's idea of clean is a little bit different. Have you all discovered that? Everybody's clean is just a little bit different. Uh, Some people's clean Uh, may be dirty compared to you, and some people's dirty may be considered what? Well, clean to you. Uh, Have you ever seen these little boxes in hospitals that squirt out this stuff in your hands? What's that called? Hand sanitizer. And we love these things. You know, you can get them in little, uh, little pouches, and you can carry them on your person at all times, because we hate what? Germs. We don't want to catch a cold. You know, there's some people who are so scared that they will use a a handkerchief to open up doors and things like that. You know, I'm completely not like that. Uh, And I think it's because I love people. And if you look at the earth, I mean, we are not very clean as people. But I think it started at a very young age. Most children, when they hit a certain age, 
There's one thing they hate above all else. Can you guess what it is? It's bath. Bath time. When a kid hits a certain age, they do not want to get a bath at all. They, they just don't want to do it. And, and I was like that. I did not want to get a bath. I was fine with my filth. I was okay with it. I was comfortable with it. But my mother was not. Right? And so most moms, when they're not sure if their kid has cleaned themselves, you know where they always check behind? The ears. Amen. We always forget. Right? It's such a strange area to wash. Right? But it, it catches things. Jesus was at a dinner party, and some of the Pharisees criticized him because his disciples did not wash their hands appropriately before they started eating. And Jesus said this very amazing thing. He said, it's not what defiles a man that goes in. It's what that comes out that defiles us. It's what comes and is birthed out of the heart, which is evil above all else. Amen. Jeremiah says we can't trust the heart. And there are some things that we will call dirty on this earth, but the Lord may find holy. Amen. You say, Chris, give me an example. John the Baptist. Amen. Right? Good Lord. He didn't bathe. He made his food locusts and wild honey. Amen. He probably had this massive beard, right? And he wore camel's uh, skin. People would have looked at him and said, uh, stay away, right? Amen. And there's been people that you've passed by and you will, in your head, say, I'm going to stay away from that person, right? Amen. But consider the inner person. Yes, yes. Are they holy inside? Are they set apart? This passage talks about holiness and being cleansed and set apart. But there's a very big difference. You know, when we drop food on the floor, we'll say what rule? Five second rule. Amen, sister. I like that, right? I like going about 15 seconds, right? And there are one, there's one thing that you drop on the floor or if you find in the couch, there's one thing that can stay in the couch for a while and it's still edible to me. M&M's, man. Right? M&M's. How can you pass up an M&M? It's got the hard shell for a reason. It's built to last, right? M&M's. You find it in a couch. You bring them to me. All right? They're wonderful. It's not what goes in that defiles a man. It's what comes out. Amen? Amen? Probably not a wise thing to eat old food, okay? It's probably not wise to eat dirty food. But what is truly wise is to seek a holy life. Amen. Amen? To seek a holy life. You know how hard it is to seek a holy life today? To seek a life that is set apart. Because we live in a culture that is so saturated in a sin culture that there are Christians who don't even realize Amen. how unholy a life that they're living because we're so saturated in a sin culture culture. And it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. For you to be holy and live a counterculture life, people are going to look at you and say they are different. And you know, that's the point. In the law, there were two types of holiness. There were ceremonial holiness laws, and then there were what we call moral holiness laws. Now the ceremonial was simply to teach you what holiness looks like. Uh, sort of like you sewing a new piece of garment on old garment. Just practical things that would say these two things don't belong because God wants separation between old and new, between death and life. That God is placing in our minds and hearts this idea that there is a difference between God and man. There's a difference. Now, the moral holiness regards what happens on the inside. So the ceremonial stuff is what we do, and the moral things is what happens in our heart. Jesus said before a bunch of Jewish men, I say to you, it says in the law that you shall not commit adultery. And all the men were like, oh yes, that is right. I've never done that. And then Jesus said, well, if you've ever lusted after a woman, it's as if you've already committed that sin. I wonder how many of those Jewish men were like, oh Jesus, whoa. Why'd you have to say that? 
Because Jesus goes beyond the doing. Jesus goes to the intent of the heart because it is what is from within that corrupts. And we live in a culture, if you really want to be a counterculture Christian, a holy Christian, someone who is really set apart, you must understand this one very beautiful, important thing. God, His Spirit, lives in you. Amen. That's the one thing you must understand. If you want to live a holy life, the first thing you must remember and know that God's Spirit lives in you. We have a living God, a living Savior. He's not dead. He's not in a tomb. Our Christ lives and His Spirit dwells within His people. You must know the first thing, if you want to live a holy life, that you have a Holy Spirit living inside of you. And you know what that Spirit does? It talks to you. It tells you, uh, no, do not do that. It will let you know about sin and righteousness. Amen? It will let you know about judgment. It will let you know about hell. This Holy Spirit that lives and dwells inside of us, it will let you know exactly where you need to be. And it causes inside of us this war called conviction. How many of you have ever, been, have ever experienced this word conviction or to be convicted? Amen? Amen? There's a difference between guilt and conviction. You see, the world wants you to be guilty. You know what guilt tells you? You'll never do any better. And that breathes a, a earthly sorrow, which can lead to depression. Amen? Guilt from the world says you'll never do any better. But listen... That Holy Spirit convicts us because the Holy Spirit says, listen, you are a child of God and you can do better. God can will you through it. And you can seek and pursue God through darkness. That the Holy Spirit is saying, live for me. Amen. And your flesh says, live for you. And so we live in a culture that says, live for you. And that's why in our culture, truth is relevant. It's relevant. There's no absolute truth in our culture. The culture tries to paint this gray area. And, and here's what it says. As long as it makes you happy, it's right. And if it makes you unhappy, it's what? Wrong. What's wrong with that? Well, everything. Everything. Because we have truth. Amen. It sets the standard for us. You know, this prophecy that Haggai gets, and it's, it's very it is beautiful. And Haggai is given this prophecy. We only have a very short prophecy from Haggai here. But he tackles five things here that our culture is facing today and needs to know about. The first thing that he talks about is a future promise. Do we have a future promise as Christians? Amen. We do. We have a future promise. You see, the Jews had a future promise. After their captivity, you know what their promise was? They just wanted to get back to Jerusalem. They wanted to start to build the temple. They wanted to get their city built back up again. And you know, King Darius began to let the Jews free to build and rebuild their temple. But somewhere along the lines, when they began to start to build the temple... They kind of got lazy and they stopped building it. And so God spoke to Haggai and he says this in verse 3 of chapter 1. He says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, It is time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins. Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you earn wages, earns, and he who earns wages earns wages to put them in a bag with holes. How many of you have ever thought, felt like your pocketbook or your wallet was like that? It just had holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. So God calls His people out. God has let some of them go back to Jerusalem. They start building the temple and then they go off and build their own homes. And God says, what about my house? Consider your ways. Could it be that when we seek to pursue God's wants and desires, that God will supply every need we have? And that when we try to meet our own needs and supply our own demands, that it's like our pocket has a hole in it. It's like we'll drink and never be quenched. It's like we'll eat and we'll never be filled. Because we were created to glorify God That's what our purpose is, is to glorify Him. And if we are not fulfilling that purpose, we are going to feel feel empty inside. Now, God wanted them to build His house up. That was His temple. That was where the presence of God dwelt among the people. Well, listen, it's different now, isn't it? We have a future hope. Amen? But here on earth, God has given us a temple. What temple is that? Our temple. Amen. Amen. We are the temple. And that mercy seat, the inner sanctuary, the most holy of holies, you know where that is? That's your heart. Amen. Amen. You know that thing that Jeremiah said is deceitful above all things? And Jesus said, defilement comes within, it comes from within the heart. The Holy Spirit cleans that heart out. Amen. Amen. Praise God, it, it cleans that heart out. And so Jesus can sit on the throne of your heart. But listen, whatever you place in the center on top of your heart will become your king and your God. And there are many people who do not have Jesus sitting on the throne of their hearts. They may have other people sitting there. They may have other things sitting there. They may have something that they feel like they can't live without sitting there. When this place belongs to the Lord Jesus And do you know why? One, God created us and we're His. And number two, Jesus earned that place. He gave Himself to sit there on the seats of our heart that He may be our King. So, how's your temple doing? Amen? Is your temple prepared and ready for the future glory? Our future hope? Are you training yourself in godliness? And are you pursuing it? And listen, I try to take care of this temple. I do. I try to take care of it. And you know, we can run and exercise and all that, but there are some people who have made their bodies their God. What is very important is to seek and pursue godliness and a new God's Word. If you're spiritually healthy, you're going to feel physically good. And listen, I'm not saying don't exercise. Don't try to get out of that. We need to take care of ourselves so that we may glorify God with everything that He has given us. And let me tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, God has made you just the way you are for His purpose and glory. And there are so many people chasing and pursuing a lie that they have to look a certain way and be a certain way. Enjoy the temple that God has given you and praise Him with it. Haggai is given another word from God. It says here in verses 12 through 13, it says, Then Zerubbabel the son of Shaltiel and Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, they heard Haggai speak. They said, And it says, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. We'll stop right there. The people heard, the people listened, and they feared the presence of the Lord. We're never going to change our lives, and people are not going to change their ways unless they hear God's word and they respond to it. Amen? Hearing, and they feared. So hearing and fearing a little bit. We live in a culture that does not fear God. 
There's no fear. And you know, when I say that, I'm not talking about that we should have a fear that we're frightened of God. When I say fear, I'm talking about an awe that you understand yeah. that God could just say, you don't exist anymore. Exactly. You're gone. You know what's an amazing thing? Do you all know that big hurricane that was going to hit Mexico? It was like humongous. It was bigger than Katrina. It had reached the max. They'd never seen a hurricane so big. And listen, have you seen the news talk much about it afterwards? It's like it doesn't even exist now. But this hurricane was hurtling towards Mexico. Huge. It was going to be devastating. And right when it gets to Mexico, it's as if it dissipates into just this tropical depression. And they said it was the mountains that did it. The mountains rain. The mountainous range stopped the winds. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. When God works in a, a miraculous way, give glory to Him. You know what stopped that hurricane from devastating all those people? It was the very hands of God. God said no. And there are times that God says yes. And we must go with God. Whether He says yes or whether He says no, we must go with Him. And we just must obey Him. Jesus said that if you know My commandments and you do them and if you obey them, you love Me. Love Jesus. Obey Him. Listen to Him. Because He's given us this temple and a spirit to live inside of us. And we must obey Him. Because He has given us great and precious promises of peace. If we would just obey Jesus, we'd have peace. Amen? I could like end the sermon right now, but I'm going to go for another hour. All right? Right? Amen. Listen, if we would just obey Jesus, we'd have peace. Amen? If we would live the Bible, we would have peace. And I'm not talking about, oh, life is great kind of peace. I'm talking about a peace that is deep. Amen. I'm talking about a peace that the world can't shake. Amen. A peace that surpasses what? All understanding. If we would just hear the words of the Lord Jesus and obey Him. He would give us peace. And He promised His people peace. But then we go back to this first prophecy we looked at when we read. Because God wanted to make a point with the people. He talked about holy meat. Meat sacrificed unto God. And He said, Haggai, ask the priests if that meat was to touch anything, will it make it holy? Now this is a very interesting theological question of that time because the, the meat had been set apart and it was to be given to God, and so it would be considered holy. And if it touched anything, it, it wouldn't have made anything else holy. The, only the meat would have stayed holy. But, if that meat was unclean, or if a person was unclean who had touched someone who had been dead, and they touched something else, what would have been, it would have became unclean. So God, He set up this understanding the difference between his hands and our hands. Our hands are very limited. Amen? Amen. Sin has power over people today. But Jesus came to cleanse us from what? Sin. All unrighteousness. He's come to cleanse us. And so... If I'm a Christian, wouldn't it be so cool, right, if I could just go up to somebody and say, and touch them and say, you're a Christian now. Amen. And then I could run up with somebody and I was like, you're a Christian now. Amen. And you're a Christian now. And then they can play tag your Christian too, right? I wish Christianity was that easy. Amen? Amen? Just a big game of tag, right? But it's not like that. Amen. Jesus comes in to our temple. He cleans our hearts out. He makes us new, a brand new living creature. And He creates us and we're cleansed from within. Amen. But there are those who are still in sin. They're lost. They're in darkness. And I wish it was easy enough to just go and touch them and the darkness would, would, would go away and Jesus would reign in their hearts as well. But it's not that simple, is it? Because it's a personal decision. 
It's a divine moment where a person realizes the very presence of God is living and desires to be a part of their lives for eternity. Not just while they live on the earth, for eternity. And we're promised eternity. Are we seeking and pursuing a holy life? Haggai was given promise of future. His people needed to be obedient in it. He promised them a future peace. He promises them cleanliness, holiness, if they would just obey and listen to Him. You know what? This prophecy ends very interestingly because we talk about a name called Zer- a man named Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel, he was basically a child of Babylon. He was born during the captivity. But God had favor on him. And he was of the line of kings. And he was one of the first people to go back to Jerusalem and begin the rebuilding. And this is what Haggai prophesied over Shaltiel, or Shaltiel's son, uh, Zerubbabel. It says here in verse 20, And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai in the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and saying, I will shake heaven and earth, I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms, I will destroy the, the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaltiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring for those I have chosen, says the Lord of hosts. He will make Zerubbabel a signet ring. Now a king, when he would make an official decree, to make it official, he would put a seal upon it. Zerubbabel, if you look in the lineage of Jesus, he's there. You know, God has placed a seal on the hearts of His Christians. And that seal is the Holy Spirit. How's your heart? Has it been sealed? Has Jesus cleaned it out? Does He sit upon the throne? How's your temple doing? Are you maintaining it? You're keeping it up? Or have you given it to Him? Amen. Because God will get His glory. He will. And I want to be able to give Him that glory. Amen? I want to be able to give Him that glory. And the only way people will ever see the glory of God is when His creation shouts His name. Are you going to shout His name? Or are you going to praise Him? Because God needs glory. Amen? And He will get it. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, we wish and desire to glorify You. Even in our weak condition, our brokenness, even when we fail You, even when we sin, Lord, Your grace and Your mercy is sufficient. And God, we just pray that we would be a holy people in a perverse and crooked generation. God, that we may see You move. And Lord, that we would get to move with You. And we pray this in Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen.